Well, good evening and thank you for joining us again. Um, last week, Friday, we had a fantastic session between Dr. Brouvet and myself where we spoke through why I wasn't vaccinated. We spoke about the treatment options um, that are needed. We spoke a lot about vaccines. And there were also a lot of questions on our Facebook page. So we've gone back to our Facebook um, users and we've told them they can send us the questions that weren't answered and any other new questions. And we've now taken all of those questions and we realized many of these questions had to do with uh, mental health and anxiety. A lot of them had to do with the state hospitals. And a lot of them were follow-up questions to Dr. Brevet. And that's how we've now constituted this panel. And I'm the least qualified on this panel. And, I, and maybe once I've done the introductions, you'll realize why I say that. Because on my, on my right, I've got Dr. Belinda Brevet, who's a specialist psychiatrist. And I've got Dr. Hamnyela, who's also a specialist psychiatrist and works uh, for the state. I've got Dr. Brevere again, who many of you by now know is a specialist physician and a pulmonologist. And then I've also got Dr. Ellitson, who is a, he calls himself a medical officer, but he's a lot more than that. And he's also a state medical doctor. So between the four of them and the few questions that are going to be directed at me, this is our, our next session of um, the Flon Conversation. The format that we'll follow is Blanche Gorosses from the NBC will be directing the questions. If any of you have questions that you want to ask, please go onto the Facebook uh, page of the First Lady of the Republic of Namibia, put that question there, and we'll try to make sure that this panel asks the question. There have also been a lot of answers given by the Ministry of Health, which are official answers, which will also be going through around what kind of vaccines are we looking at in the future and some of the procedures that are done at the, at the testing centers. So, so I think, Blanche, you can really start with the questions that we've taken from our platforms. Well, uh, thank you, Madam First Lady. And there are quite a mouthful here. And around the vaccines, some of the questions are if, the vaccine is safe, why do people need to, to sign a consent form? I think uh, you can take that. And then why is the death rate going up now that people have started to take the vaccine and they were not dying in big numbers last year, for example? Uh, why do we all need to go for a vaccine? Can we just wait for herd immunity? These are just some of the questions being posted here and do I need to vaccinate after contracting COVID and if so how long must I wait so these are some of the questions I think Dr. Brewer and uh, yourself as the medical officer can take some of the questions around the vaccines. So thank you very much for your question so we'll take the question in parts so just um as to the concern regarding why we need consent for the vaccine for any therapeutic intervention, I think uh, everybody would need to have informed consent. So I think um, that is the main concern that we have with regards to the, the procedure that the intervention that's being given. And, and in this regard, it is the coronavirus vaccine. So it's, it's nothing special, nothing extraordinary. It's just that we need informed consent. And with regards to um, why the, the death rate is currently going up, um, I think it's, it's, it's very important for us to say that initially our responsiveness to the vaccine was very, very poor. So it's very difficult for us to correlate the um, vaccine to the increasing numbers of deaths. It's, it's probably more appropriate to say that uh, people really haven't been responsive enough to the vaccine and the community transmission of the virus has actually be, been taking its effect as we expected. If I can add to that, the, the, the death rate, and you can correct me, is probably correlated to the number inf of infections. And because we have higher infections, we have higher death rates. And that's why it's such a priority to get the infections down so that the death rate goes down. Yes, absolutely. And I think also that speaks to w this question about herd immunity. In order for us to gain herd immunity, we have to r weigh the risks and the benefits to ourselves. So concerning um, getting herd immunity, the natural way by, by acquiring a natural infection as opposed to getting herd immunity 
by um, getting vaccinated. I think that is probably what we're sitting with and what we're dealing with. If we are going to wait, watch and wait for herd immunity, we are going to sit with unprecedented, uh, an unprecedented crisis, a human humanitarian crisis in a manner of speaking. take this one. I think it's a discussion that you had with the First Lady and to the President. The person is asked whether they can take the vaccine still after contracting the virus. Yeah, sure. So um, <coughs> the, uh, the short answer is yes, you can. Um, currently, the, for the two vaccines that we have available in Namibia, the, the ministerial guidelines is that you can take it after two weeks um, after completion of your isolation period. Um, there are some newer guidelines coming that for some of the other vaccines you should probably wait about four weeks before taking it. But, but yes, the, 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 the recommendation is absolutely to, to take the vaccine um, after having had, the, having had the coronavirus. And that is purely to enhance your own immunity, your natural immunity, um, and to protect yourself from getting, getting reinfected. And just before I hand over to Madam First Lady, the last one would be, does Namibia have a fixed guideline on age recommendation per vaccine time? So the, the current vaccines that we have available, um, all of them are only registered for adults, so 18 years and older. Um, and there is no specific recommendation as to, in, in that population, which, which vaccine can go to, to which, um, which uh, age group specifically. Um, maybe we can also just in this touch on the, the, the younger age group because I think that is important. Um, some of the vaccines, Pfizer specifically, have been studied in the, age, in the younger age group, sort of um, 12 years to 18 years of age. And, in, and they've, they've found that to be a safe vaccine in that age group. Um, we don't have Pfizer available in Namibia at this stage, um, but, but in future that might, might become available. And then in the age group younger than 12 years, um, there, there no study, well, there's actually ongoing studies in that age group, two years to 12 years, but we don't have data available in that, in that age group. So currently of all the vaccines that's available, that age group cannot be vaccinated yet. I'm handing over to you. There is a question here directed to you. Why is the First Lady not taking the vaccines that are currently available in the country? And once I've um, answered that, I think, Branch, let's go through the questions, each one as they are, because those are the ones that we hoovered from our social media pages. And I think people are waiting for those, um, for those answers, unless I'm interfering with your process and you want to come back to them. Okay, so, so why have I not taken the vaccines available in the country? So this is, I think it's important to answer it again. Um, the full answer is on our Friday. So if you go on our, our session with Dr. Brouvet on, on Friday, we answered this question in depth as to why I wasn't vaccinated, um, which likely led to the reason why we contracted COVID. So the question about why I haven't vaccinated yet, I think is the question of, how long do you vaccinate after you've contracted COVID? I think there's different guidelines. Some people are saying, some countries are following two weeks, some are following three months, and some are saying between three to six months. Personally, I'm very eager to get vaccinated, and I've set a date for the 29th of June that I'd like to vaccinate with one of the vaccines that are in the country and is available to everybody. So I'm, I'm surprised by the question uh, because on Friday it was my intent to get vaccinated um, at a testing centre with the vaccines that are available. Okay, thanks. So we'll continue with the discussion and then come back to the questions. Thanks, Blanche. So the question, once vaccinated, do I need to adhere to health public health regulations by continuing to wear a mask, social distance, and sanitize? So in, in short, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, even in spite of the fact that the vaccines that we have available to us have such high efficacy numbers, I think it's important for us to realize that for every individual person, there is still that small risk that you may acquire the infection. All that it means is when you get exposed to the coronavirus, there's less likely, 
there's less likelihood for you to uh, acquire the infection. So I think, yes, in short, absolutely, we should wear masks and sanitize. Babies and children safe from COVID, and why can't they take the vaccine? I think I, I answered that in the in the previous discussion. Um, they the, the the current available vaccines in Namibia hasn't been tested in in that age group, so we can't vaccinate them. As I said, the um, some of the companies, some of the manufacturers with with some of the other vaccines are trialing it in in the younger population, not necessarily in the age group under two years yet but in the sort of slightly older. But everybody is, is susceptible to COVID. Um, fortunately, the younger population tend not to have such severe disease and tend not to end up in hospital. Um, and so I think we're fortunate in, in that way. But um, we'll probably get to a point where, where younger children um, might qualify for vaccinations in the future. can be tackled by Dr. Brewer and also yourself a uh, question on what is the impact of COVID-19 or vaccine on people undergoing hormonal treatment including those who are undergoing gender transitions? I cannot think that it will have any impact except that it will cause you to have immunity against coronavirus because the vaccine doesn't do anything else than you introduce the virus to the to the body's immune system and it stimulates the immune system. So it, I also had questions about fertility and infertility. It really does not work on that level of the body. So it will not have an effect on the, on the pr process that the patient is following. I think a bigger problem is the mental health issues associated with um, coronavirus and the pandemic and that people really struggling with certain issues will have that amplified because of what we are going through at the moment. So they must please vaccinate as well. Yeah. So that means it will not interfere with the prescriptions given by the doctors for hormonal? Not at all. Mm -hmm. um, should I first take a COVID test to make sure that I don't have COVID before I vaccinate? Um, at the moment, the guidelines is not that you don't have to take a, vac uh, a test before going for the vaccination. Obviously, if you're sick, um, if you've got symptoms, um, we don't recommend, firstly, even if you have a flu, we don't recommend that you, that you be vaccinated. But um, if you're totally asymptomatic, healthy, then there's no reason to go for the COVID test before going for the, for the COVID vaccine. Okay, fine, then. The second part of the questions on vaccine is reasons for not taking the vaccine. Some people citing they are not taking the vaccine because they put, in, put their faith in the power of prayer. Question is, if I take the vaccine, will it look like I don't have enough faith? Doctor, um, Dr. I Dr. think we would like to answer that from the perspective of mental health. Um, regardless of what a person believes in, all of us believe in a higher power above ourselves. Even if you say um, we believe only in prayer or in God, even God himself, when he was healing people, he was giving medicines and then praying. So we are saying that your faith and you yourself, your behavior is the determinant factor that will de de determine whether you are actually a true believer in yourself. Are you, are you abiding by the rules? There are regulations set in place. This is to, to, to decrease the number of um, the, the infection. But if you yourself, you are not adhering to it, then that is where we are transmitting the, the, the illness. So the behavior then we are saying, even though it is said that we have to social distance and we have to wear masks, this is something new that we are introducing. And people are only doing it because it is the rule that is put up by His Excellency. But within yourself, they don't have that commitment to say, I am abiding, obeying by this because I have the, the determination and you don't 
own that. If you own it, then obviously then we are saying that, yes, then we will decrease the, the, the number and then even your faith, you can bring it in. But we are not saying that because you believe only in prayers, do not take the precautions and do not take the medication. You have to do all things at the same time. Mm -hmm. If I can just add that, why then does this or do churches feel that uh, they are being targeted with these uh, regulations? Um, I will not answer on behalf of the churches, mm -hmm. but as an individual, you have to decide. Am I believing in a person who is running this church or are you believing in God? If you are saying I'm doing this because my pastor is saying or our church leader is saying, then definitely you're not believing in God. You are um, worshipping the image of a person. Then there you are failing God. So we are not supposed to use the name of God in place where it is not supposed to be. We say we have to be accountable and ask yourself, is this my faith or is it the person that I'm worshipping? So if that person is not in that church, that means you have nothing that you are holding on to. Mm -hmm. I must agree with this. Um, because I also know many pastors who have themselves been vaccinated, believe in vaccination, and encourage their congregation to get vaccinated. And the bottom line is this, uh, Blanche. At this point, we do not put our faith in politicians, pastors. Uh, we put our faith in the evidence and the experts. So to me, we must decenter people who are not experts. That would include people like me, because I know there are people who listen to me, but I could be wrong. So the important part is here, people must do their own assessments, apply critical thinking, um, review the information themselves and take the advice of experts and the evidence available. And uh, there's also a question because I know this, since the rollout campaign, it has always been, is it voluntary, is it compulsory? That question around there. There are questions here asking, why should everyone get vaccinated? Is it not supposed to be voluntary? Let those who want to get vac who want to get the vaccine get vaccinated. And why is it being pushed down our throats? So I, if I can answer on that. So <laughs> the only way we are going to survive this pandemic and all the consequences that we are already bearing financially, socially, emotionally, educationally, I think a, a big principle will be altruism. We as a Namibian nation, we as a world need to stop thinking only about ourselves and think how can we together win this, this invisible enemy that we are facing. And part of that is vaccination. Part of that is the social distancing and the masking. I mean, it's really difficult with the elderly people sitting isolated in old age homes, but you do it because you love them. You don't want to infect your, your grandma. It's difficult with the children not being able to school. But I think altruism and, and being together as a nation and stop thinking just about yourself and how you can protect the community by doing some of these things that um, the scientists, the frontline workers are begging people to do. That's the way forward and not here and there, everybody just voicing their own opinion. So why then the feeling that uh, the vaccinations are being pushed down the throats of the population? I don't, I don't think we, we, we are pushing them or forcing people. The reason why I think people feel that we are, we are, we are forcing them is that, yes, um, government and uh, the ministry is putting the adverts in, in, on the radios, on TV. This is only basically to, 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 to inform the nation with evidence-based practice. When we are saying evidence-based practice, it's like you're using your own data that you are having in your own country within your population to say, okay, in my country, this much percent is, has been vaccinated. Now you compare it, obviously you have to compare it internationally to say, how, f how are you faring compared to other countries? Now, if we all refuse to take the vaccine, then that means Namibia is not compatible at all. And then that means we need to think of our own families. If you love your family, which we of course do, do you want to be the one responsible for their death? 
if you're not vaccinated, if you're not social distancing, it means you're going to infect the most vulnerable, the babies and your grandma and your grandfather. They will die. And then you have to deal with this grief and the guilt. And then mentally, you are also not coping. And we're already not coping with people losing their loved ones. They don't have closure. But then if you are the one who's responsible, why not? All the vaccines in the world, when we were little, we were vaccinated. You know, and we managed to grow up healthy because of that vaccine. So the data used was, was from other countries, but because we also documenting to say 15 of us has been vaccinated today, give the difference part. Is it female, male, age? Are you having comorbidities or what? And then you compare that. But if we are not doing that, then we are really failing our country and failing ourselves. So we need to do that. We need to take responsibility. We need to be accountable for our own lives. Don't think about other families, but start with your own family and then you extend it to the other people. We need to love each other and care for each other. And I want to expand on that with the concept of love protects, which is the basis of this whole campaign, because love does protect. You, you protect those you love as an individual, as a unit in your family, every single day for obvious reasons. But I think it's also the responsibility of any state to protect its people. Now, vaccines and COVID is not a Namibia specific issue. It's a global pandemic. And we're seeing the scenes of how people are dying from COVID. We've seen what it looks like in India, in Brazil. We've also seen pictures of the UEFA Cups where people in Europe or without masks, they are hugging each other, they are sitting on top of each other. And we also know in Switzerland, not a single person has been admitted in a hospital for COVID. And what was the solution there? It was vaccine. So imagine how irresponsible, how murderous it would be for a state to decide, I will not encourage people to vaccinate, I will not even buy vaccines, it's not necessary because somehow we'll come to natural herd immunity. I think that would be the crime. So it's not about forcing it down anybody's throat. It's really about giving people the evidence of what we can get right and we're not going to reach herd immunity. Sweden tried this, it didn't work. People died as a result of this. So if a country decides to use the best available evidence to save its people, it's not th pushing down anything down anybody's throat. It's saving lives because that's what vaccines do. It's saving lives. And beyond the love protects. If we don't vaccinate, another wave comes. With every wave comes new mutations. Mm. We cannot afford it mm. from a mental health perspective. We don't have the financial resources. We don't have the healthcare workers who are resigning every day from our hospitals because they can't keep up. We don't have the money to pay for these vaccines all the time because they are expensive. And these mutations, some don't work against certain mutations. Um, the economy can't afford this. So I was so happy when the uh, governor of the Bank of Namibia said um, that economic policy is about vaccination. So, so there's so many things that rely on us accepting that we need to get vaccinated. I just want to say from the point of departure of a frontline worker, physically dealing with um, patients that suffer from coronavirus every day, it's not necessarily that it's your grandmother and it's not necessarily that it's going to be somebody who has some form of an immu immunosuppression. We are dealing with young people like myself who are succumbing to this virus. So this is really, it's not, it's from the point of departure of caring for other people. It is an act of, of, of love, as we say. So I think we'd really like to encourage everyone to not think of it as something that's being coerced upon you but as, as we are acting together to protect our, our family members. Absolutely. Yes. Can, I, can I just add a very important point he, he made? Doc said uh, it's young people like them that, that are really leaving us at the moment. So we are saying it is also the same population mm -hmm. that is refusing mm -hmm. to take the vaccine. It's the same population that is social media wise and therefore they read the wrong wrong information and spread it to people and because they have a, a bigger population that reads 
they follow that and they believe in the false information. So we are saying even if you're reading or you're on the, on the social media, decide, be very discreet in, in being able to say this is the truth, this is not the truth. Be biological, scientific to say I am depending on facts, you know. And the healthcare workers, honestly, they are suffering mentally. Mm -hmm. We are trying our best to, to do therapy. I'm on, on the psychosocial group for the ministry, and I also work private. But we cannot manage to support mentally the healthcare workers alone because of the huge amount of death that they are seeing every day. And then that means then also the psychosocial phone is available for the entire society. So they also call in. So it is also draining on you as a therapist and then the poor healthcare workers that are directly dealing with the COVID patients. So let us really, it is really important that we bring our part. So what then happens when, when love not failing to protect, but then when it's questioned. And I think this is the, the next question is one that will have to be tackled by all the panelists. This person asking, my traditional leader, parent, friend, pastor, doesn't believe in vaccine and I decided to follow their example and not get vaccinated. As they say, it's too risky. Maybe the first lady can start. I think I've already answered it, that we must all take our own decisions from experts, our pastors, our parents, our best friends, our peers, our employer, rich businessmen from the north who say it's a Bill Gates conspiracy. They are not experts. They are rich, they are pastors, that's what they are. They are not experts in this. So my advice is take your own advice, because when you're sitting on that hospital bed and Dr. Brevet and Dr. Ellison have to treat you, Nobody else can help you. And, and just the last thing I'd like to say is uh, we don't know each other. And we don't know of any global conspiracy being pushed by elites to force this on anybody. Or there's no motive, no financial or any other motive for us to be here lying to a nation of people as if, I don't know where, I, I, I don't know the logic that thinks that so many countries can coalesce to have this conspiracy theory and so many of us can be part of this Illuminati, I don't know, this little demonic plot. It, I, don't, I, I don't understand it, Blanche, um, why people would raise something like that. We come from different walks of life and we are experiencing this virus from different perspectives. We've all seen the evidence. Is it not because um, also a question here stating that Vaccines were developed too fast within a year and are not deemed safe. Dr. Brewer. Yeah, maybe I, I should talk about that. Uh, va vaccines and vaccine development has been with us for many, many, many years. It's not a thing that started now. Um, coronavirus vaccine research started decades ago with the first SARS coronavirus that we had. Um, if I'm not mistaken on the date, it's about 2003. And since then, um, it's, uh, research has been ongoing. I mean, and <coughs> the vaccine development has been ongoing. The, with, with regards to the, the current vaccines, there were definitely no steps skipped in, in the development. It went through the phase one, the phase two, the phase three trials. I think what helped with the speed of development is the fact that it, it was a worldwide effort. There's a lot of collaboration between um, companies working together, universities taking, for instance, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Oxford University teamed up with AstraZeneca to try and speed up the process um, to make it more fluent to to develop these these vaccines so that we can save the world because that's ultimately what what we wanted to do um, and because of the the pandemic um, many companies jumped into this so if you if, normally in in medicine um, drug development takes longer because it's one company it does not want to share its data with anybody else because he, that company has to make a maximum profit from this. In this case, this was a worldwide pandemic and the companies decided, listen, we can't go chasing profit. We have to 
collaborate. We have to try and speed this, the, the process up. But with regards to the, the um, steps in development, going through the phases, there was no, no, no um, shortcuts taken. And that, is, that brought us to the position where we know these vaccines are effective and they, we know they're safe. Um, and that's, yeah, that's what we wanted to have. Yes, doctor. Scientific research with any medicine, vaccination, any therapeutic development, there's very strict ethical guidelines to doing any research. So with these vaccines that did go through all the phases and were are, are being used, there were many that did not make the cut because they, they got stuck in certain phases. So remember, as medical doctors, we have an oath. Um, we are, have rigorous scientific training. We have to do good, you know, help your patient. And at this moment, especially with patients following conspiracy theories, not wanting to look at scientific evidence and make a good decision, we are having doctors phone and asking for beds in the hospital, asking for oxygen, and, and there's none. So that's, for a frontline worker, a very difficult position in to be in and not be able to help, not be able to give the care that your patient needs to survive. Um, so I think people can really just look at the evidence, the way that we've been developing medicines and vaccines for over the years. Nothing was done differently except that the world worked together. If people wanted to, if uh, the whole theory about the 5G chip, people monitoring you, if you don't want that to be done, then put away your phone. Because we know exactly, if people know where you are and where you're moving, what you're saying, because you carry your phone around. Why would they put it in a vaccine? <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yes, doctor. With the vaccination, an important thing, a point that people are missing is that with you being vaccinated, it means that even if you are to, to contact or to get um, inf infected with the virus, you will get mild symptoms as opposed to the person who has not been vaccinated. So we are asking you ourselves, would you rather wait for you to really get to a point where Dr. Brewer is saying, where doctor is sitting next to you, you are waiting for the oxygen, or would you rather be on the safer side having taken the vaccine and know that if you contract it, it will be a mild version and you just stay at home and then take the medication that the doctor is prescribing you? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, this the COVID-19 pandemic has also brought in the question of inequality or the existing question. It has just exacerbated it. There's a question on vaccine being man-made so that elites can sell it. Madam First Lady. It seems to be COVID is man-made. COVID is, is man-made, yes. The yes. So I think there's, to me, those international conspiracy theories um, are detracting us from the fact that right now, in all of the hospitals these doctors are working, people are dying. Whether it was man-made, whether it came from a bat, whether it came from Mars, right now that virus is killing people and there are solutions to stop it from killing people. We can do the philosophical debates later, but right now we don't want people to die. So there will be a review of what happened, what went wrong, what worked, what didn't work. But right now, the focus is on reducing new infections. Um, the issue about elites trying to sell a vaccine, in the Namibian context, they're making it as if we are the elites who have this plot. But in every country, the theory is there. So there must then be some kind of global elite WhatsApp group um, where everybody is making money like some kind of pyramid scheme. Um, I'm not in that WhatsApp group. I don't make a cent from a single... Uh, vaccines. Certainly the pharmaceuticals are making lots of money. Um, and that's the issue that can be talked about later. But right now, Blanche, honestly, I think we must answer questions as people ask them, which we're trying our best to do. Uh, but we've got so many questions and so little time that uh, the philosophical ones need to be answered. But I'm not sure if we should belabor them too much. And people have Google. I mean, they asked us these questions on Facebook. Mm -hmm. If they are on Facebook, if they have Google, the answers are there. I, th I think one, just from with your regard to the remarks on the on the vaccine manufacturers, I, th I think also one one should understand that many of the vaccines, have, many of the vaccine manufacturers have actually given away or sold at a reduced price the patents 
to um, generic companies making these vaccines to enable the rest of the world to get it. So it's not like the companies are only behind profit. Um, they are actually helping the rest of the world by having spent money on development, but sharing this knowledge with, with the, the generic companies to enable us to get, get access to these vaccines. Mm -hmm. And then there's a question on why is the information on vaccines and COVID always changing? something is wrong and the person goes on to say i'll rather wait and see that is medicine with medicine information changes um, that's why the specialists are the ones or the doctors are the ones up to date with with what is going on and we are the best ones to give you the information on the latest um, evidence and research out there and, and yeah. I think because, uh, as the first lady said, uh, there's mutation. Mutation meaning that the virus keeps changing. What it is today, it might not be what it is tomorrow. And in a person's body, it changes. So therefore, it is a new thing and allow science to do the research that they are saying. Allow Namibians also to open up. This is also an opportunity for us to, to venture into research within our own population. And then when it is now coming up, that is why every day we are learning something new because of, of the mutation and the vaccine, vaccine. That is why we are saying it might work, it might not work. But at right now, we are saying it is working for majority of the people. So let us go with that. And I think Dr. Gilbert, um, mm. Dr. Hamunela, actually had a great point about it. Um, well, it is true, the information is changing. And what we knew last year this time mm -hmm. about the coronavirus and how people were being treated is different from what we know today. It is a new virus. It's called a novel coronavirus for a reason. Um, so I think you had a great answer for that. No, I think we ultimately we're learning with, with regards to the virus and the effects of the virus, we, we're learning a lot. And the same will happen with regards to treatment. I mean, you will remember us going through phases where certain medications ran out of stock because people thought that this medication is going to be the end of coronavirus. So as we've as we've we're gaining experience, some of our 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 um, <coughs> data will change. But I think uh, sh sort of short-term data that we have available currently, it's looking very good for the vaccine. Our main concern with things going forward and the vaccine is. Basically, the mutations that we that we mentioned are our vaccines going to remain effective due to the slow lo s potential slow rollout of the of the vaccinations at this stage. Do we give this virus the chance to mut mutate and skip the efficacy of the or change the efficacy of our our, our vaccines? So those are things that that's of real concern to me um, in a in, in the the setting where I work currently. I mean, my colleagues overseas, living in Canada and working people I studied with saying they're going back to normal now mm -hmm. because they they the populations are vac vaccinated they don't see COVID in the hospitals anymore they don't see the x-rays that I have to look at every day um, mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. the patients lying on the ventilators anymore which is which is a concern I think with any medicine always you'll find new side effects so, um, and this is a novel, novel drug. So with all drugs, we'll find new side effects just to drive that point home. It will keep coming up as the years progress. And I think we should re be reassured by what we were um, told about the populations in the UK and populations in, in, in Canada, because we know that the admission rates in the, in the UK have gone down. I think I was just, just add there that we also know with, with other vaccines that um, we have an idea is if we develop a vaccine like so take for instance the Sinopharm virus uh, the Sinopharm vaccine the, the virus that they modeled it on is a dead virus so we know there's other hepatitis A vaccines which is modeled on a dead virus mm -hmm. there are other vaccines influenza virus is a the influenza vaccine is a dead virus so we know how the vaccines work and we will probably not get suddenly now realize there's this odd long-term side effect. I mean, it's, we, we, we can't say with 100% certainty, but with extreme level of certainty, we can say knowing how vaccines work, knowing how we, we, we um, develop these vaccines, that the long-term risk of this is extremely low. Um, what is more of concern is how long will it remain effective? That is, that is my major, major question that I have with regards to the, vac the vaccination at this stage. And the information will be shared 
Well, let's move to the specific health questions. This uh, person asking that he or she is two, about two months post-COVID, but still have a on and off chest pain with shortness of breath. Should they go for the short end, which one, or if there's a waiting period, how long? So we, I, th I think there's, there's two, two aspects of this. There is this entity called um, long COVID, which is um, also a, a field of pulmonology, which is developing. We, we're finding a lot of patients having ongoing respiratory symptoms for, for a long period of time. That does not mean that they are, are infective anymore. So it's not like they've got the virus in them. They're just struggling with the, the, the long-term effects of that. Um, I, I would definitely recommend that, that the person first consults a healthcare worker so that they can actually be physically examined to see what, what is, if there is a reason for this. But that in, its, in itself is not a contraindication to getting the vaccine. I think that's an important message. But one would like to have you checked out um, just to make sure that, that all the aspects that we can address have been fully addressed. And there's a question on people suffering from conditions like the high blood pressure, kidney failure, Down syndrome, asthma and heart condition. Can they take the jabs and which one? So to, yes, to, okay. to answer the question in short, it would be the, the best advice that I could give to them is that they would have to go to see their, their general practitioner or a specialist in that regard, particularly if they're being treated for kidney failure, if they're being treated for any sort of genetic abnormality, it would be very important for them to see a doctor before they decide on which vaccine. But if, you, if, if, the, if they're well controlled, um, for instance, the asthmatics who's well controlled, they can surely have the vaccine. The hypertensives, um, we know every patient when they go for the vaccination, when I went for the vaccination, you, you sit, they measure your blood pressure, they actually do it twice. Um, make sure that, that everything is well controlled. But if you're well controlled, chronic conditions in general aren't contraindications to getting the vaccine. Um, but again, just make sure that you're controlled and consult your, your, your health care provider. He's mentioning is that at all the vaccination areas, there is a nurse, mm -hmm. there is a doctor that's there, and they are all really uh, well trained. So we at the first station, they, they they look at your blood pressure, you know, and they will ask you if you are known to have hypertension, are you on any treatment or any of the chronic illnesses. The onus is upon you, to be honest. Also remember that some people get anxious when they are going for checkups. So could it be that that high blood pressure is just at, at that moment because you're anxious? The, the person who's there monitoring you will then probably tell you to wait for a few minutes and then we repeat it. Post the vaccination also, they check again your BP. Mm -hmm. So most majority of the people with some of the comorbidities has taken the vaccine and we are still okay. You just need to adhere to your, to your chronic medication. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's go to testing. And I think this is a question that has also been sent to media practitioners quite a lot with regard to the testing. This person is asking, I was sent back from testing because I don't have symptoms, but was looking after someone with symptoms. What if I have COVID and spread it to others? So Doctor. I think, so I think the best um, answer to that would be, if you are asymptomatic, what we would like to do is we would like to um, take the burden off of our testing centers. So if you're asymptomatic and you're caring for somebody who has coronavirus disease, what we would recommend you do is to quarantine, self-quarantine for seven days and then after uh, self-quarantine for seven days if you begin to become symptomatic then it would be advisable for you to go for the test otherwise we don't want to overburden our testing centers as we are already incapacitated and then the topical issue right now is the ivermectin and the questions around it including it looks like government wants us to die ivermectin is a cure so why isn't it widely available I think, Dr. Brewer, you can uh, yeah. take that question. Um, I think, where's the camera? <laughs> I think the important aspect that one, one has to understand is that, um, like our Medical Control Council have 
released a statement the other day. There is actually no evidence that ivermectin is the um, golden cure for, for, for coronavirus. Um, as a matter of fact, most of the reliable, properly done studies in, in the field has, has actually showed no benefit when they look at um, ivermectin com compared to a placebo drug. So there, there's actually very well done studies that show no effect. There are some small, poorly designed studies that showed potential benefit, and that's where this idea came from. And unfortunately, um, through the help of social media and the spread of, of misinformation, we're now sitting in a situation where, for some reason, people are believing that this drug is going to work. And I, I can assure you, in, in the hospital, if I, if I can get a drug that can cure people and not have me having to sit with the families and explain to them why their loved one has passed, I would love to have this. But I'm seeing on a daily basis patients coming into a hospital, having taken ivermectin, having been, s and they are severely sick, and I see patients dying after taking ivermectin. So it's, it's, it's f for me, it's a very, very um, difficult t situation to be in because on the one hand, I know we've got we've got the vaccine that that can get us out of this trouble, and now we have to fight with regards to a drug that, in practicality, is not working, and the evidence is not supporting it. I think if if government had the opportunity to to have evidence that it that it works properly, and they can em enroll it, I mean it's a cheap drug. Why would we spend this amount of money and this amount of resources trying to vaccinate people um, if we can keep our hospitals um, sort of at normal levels of admission? Um, it's 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 really a, a difficult situation as a healthcare provider to be in, um, working on the front line. Okay, but then again, there are questions around it saying, I've seen experts saying that this particular medicine works and has worked in many countries. I think that's, it's, it's very important that, that you have to look at, at that, that experts. I mean, I get the same questions. I mean, I had a discussion with a colleague of mine yesterday with regards to that. Um, <coughs> the, the reality is in, in medicine, we, um, we believe in evidence. So we want our evidence to be published in a what we call peer review journal um, preferably in a peer review in a journal that has what we call high impact factor so there's the, the the reliable journals if you want to call it that in the field of internal medicine i would mention a few new england journal of medicine the um jama there's a few um bmj those type of journals are the are the reputable journals where we know f throughout the course of history and and through the development of medicine these journals have being up to date with regards to doing studies well, etc. So what I what I always t tell my colleagues is, go and look where is th that evidence published. What you very often find is those pub those the, the 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 data that are flying around in in social media at the moment are published on not in journals, very often not in peer reviewed journals, often on the websites of the the researchers themselves. They haven't been able to get them into these reputable journals because of a specific reason. The studies that were done weren't properly done. And we can't go and prescribe medication with without proof because we don't know what the what the effects of, of it might be. We because if if a medication like in ivermectin hasn't been properly studied, same going through the phase one, phase two, phase three trials, as I mentioned with the vaccines earlier. If we if it didn't go through that, then we don't know what what the answers what, what the effect of it is going to be and these the the studies that went through those those steps um that doesn't doesn't show benefit so that's a you know, the, that's the only real answer i can give to that, that that one has to stick to the evidence otherwise what we have in medicine and there's a glaring um contradiction in vaccines that have gone through all the steps have been used over two billion people in the world with limited side effects. So there's a contradiction with somebody who says, I don't trust the vaccine, but I trust ivermectin. Or somebody who says, I'm not going to use the vaccine because I believe in prayer, but I'm going to trust ivermectin because uh, there aren't more studies on ivermectin than there are on this vaccine because the vaccine went through human trials. It went through all of the stages that it had to go through. It's been used over two billion people in the world. 
So its side effects are known, the side effects that have manifested over 2 billion people. The same can't be said for this. So I'm not sure about saying I don't trust this one that has been rigor rigorously tested, but I'm going to try for this one. There's a question, I think, Dr. Elson, have you dealt with the request for a patient to use ivermectin? Because there's a question stating that uh, I, have, I know someone who used it and has recovered. So I, on a daily basis, get barraged with this question. And my answer is the press release by the Namibia Medicines Regulatory Council, yeah. which is we need to have, and it comes back to the point that Dr. Brevere uh, brought, about, brought out, we need robust evidence, and we just don't have robust evidence for ivermectin. So the next batch of questions are around anxiety and grief. With death uh, rates going up, um, there's a question saying, I'm surrounded by so much loss and grief each and every day. I'm hearing more and more people who have died. How do I manage my anxiety? Dr. Hamniela, you may start. Okay, yeah, that is the important area now when it comes to COVID and mental health. And that is where we need to invest now. Um, definitely people are dying. Definitely they're dying from the COVID itself. They are dying because of the effect the COVID has on them. But now the important thing is how are they dealing with this death and loss in their own families? You know, every day when you are hearing, this actually raises a lot of stress. Now, for example, a person who already suffers from anxiety, during this particular time period, the anxiety is three times higher than it is normally is. So also take into cognizance that the anxiety symptoms are similar to the COVID symptoms. The only difference is that they do not have a fever. Ne? With, with anxiety, they don't have a fever. So you will keep going and keep going. Now, the more you are thinking about it, the more your anxiety goes up. So we are saying, what are you going to do now? Even though we are saying you're isolating yourself, we're saying isolation is not as good for a person with anxiety, but you have to make your environment comfortable, conducive to you. Talk to somebody, even if it is, you know, uh, on telephone, on Skype, on WhatsApp, call somebody. But we are saying talk to somebody who has a positive impact on you. Mm -hmm. Don't indulge in people who are bringing you down or feeding you with negative things because this is also going to feed your anxiety. Apart from anxiety, we also say in this time period, depression also comes in. And then substance also comes in because of the rules mm -hmm. and regulations. We are not able to socialize. We are not able to be with our family. So therefore, the one thing we are doing is we are overindulging in the substance to fill that void and to fill the anxiety. So we are saying we have specialists in that area. We call them the behavioral science section. We need to involve people in that in that area which will include your psychologist will include psychiatrists will include psych social workers occupational therapists and then physio physiotherapists also we need them because after effect of this like dr Bruve said they will have problems with the lungs even the brain even walking and stuff so if you don't involve all this multidisciplinary team the person you go very down and then suicide as the consequences of that. So we need to allow our people to grieve and we are saying there are a lot of stages for grieving. Mm -hmm. The five stages, we have to go through them. If you are stuck at one point, obviously you are not going to move on and you will have a lot of mental issues. So now is the time we are saying invest in that. Be comfortable to say, I have a shrink. People have a stigma against that, and it's a problem, yeah. you know? So it's like we all have psychologists, we all have psychiatrists, in as much as we are psychiatrists. We also have where you go deep, breathe, and de-traumatize yourself about that. One of the big problems with, with loss is that you cannot greet. You cannot gather around your loved one's bed, um, say proper goodbye. I know you've allowed some patients to come into the unit, um, to, to grieve the lo uh, to 
to greet the loved ones and also the funerals because you cannot it cannot be um, held as one would usually want to um, support each other that that's really difficult and we have to make sure and follow up patients um, once loved ones has died whether they are f going through the grief process so when the, you look at the research w with regards to SARS and MERS the previous um, uh, infections which wasn't as as severe as what has hit the world now the the most prominent psychiatric sequela was anxiety depression um, insomnia, substance abuse, post-traumatic stress disorder, and then the grief. So these are the things we need to look at and suicide. Uh, what I try and tell my patients who sits with me in, in, in the consulting rooms, and also what I can advise to people here, to manage your anxiety and to manage your distress, is think of what can you control, and then control that. Mm -hmm. One of that is vaccination. So if you know, and I can tell my patients I'm vaccinated. So yes, we wear a mask, we social distance, but I'm actually cool. I'm not too stressed that I'm going to get corona. And if I do get it, it's definitely not going to be bad. So, so do what you can do to control your anxiety. So then you can tell yourself, oh, I'm okay. I'm vaccinated. My mother is vaccinated. So we are going to be okay. Control keeping your immune system healthy. How do we do that? You exercise. You take enough fluids. Stay away from drugs and alcohol. Um, get some sunshine. We live in a country with a lot of lovely outside fresh air and sunshine. Eat healthy speak to somebody when when you are feeling um, stressed and then stay away from social media put off the tv stay, put away your phone rather go and sit and spend time with your family and let's speak about our dreams our fears our hopes rather than sitting with facebook and reading all these conspiracies so so that's what i would tell patients and if you do feel that you're really struggling then speak to people, you have trauma counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, people are doing virtual consultations these days, so you don't even have to expose yourself to COVID to, to consult with somebody. Does that not speak to the question of accessibility? How accessible are these services for the general public out there? I think uh, Dr. Elton, you can also come in there. So at the moment, with regards, I, I can only speak um, with regards to the state facilities. So at the moment with regards to state practice, we are a little bit incap incapacitated, but that doesn't mean that we have completely stopped the services that we usually offer to our patients. So I think that um, generally speaking, we have um, hotlines that are available for our patients, particularly if you feel that you are overwhelmed by social media, that you feel that you're overwhelmed by what has happened in your family, you may have lost a, lo a close loved one. I think um, the mental health centre is still available and it's still open. Yeah, I, can, I can add on that. Um, the mental health centre is w the only centre that, um, compared to other centres, that have specific days. Ideally, we said uh, Monday and Wednesdays are our outpatient days, meaning the other three days we are doing inpatients and the forensic observation. But now, now at the moment, like today is Wednesday, our OPD was packed up to outside. What's an OPD? Uh, outpatient uh, department for psychiatry was packed up to outside. We were distancing inside and outside, but it is still <laughs> there. It, is, it was there. Now, we, we, we are very, very short-staffed. We, we are working with only three psychiatrists for the state, of which mm -hmm. two of us does private in the afternoon. Then... Our medical officers at the moment, we only have three that are on site. And then every day we reach the number of 100. Mm -hmm. And we have to manage those patients because they are already vulnerable mm -hmm. because of the mental illness. Mm -hmm. And then the anxiety itself is brought on even being on in the COVID. So you do not expect our patients to understand. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So we really try to do that. But apart from that, the same psychiatrists and the same people who are working at the mental, mental hospital are the ones that are on call 24 hours sure. for psychosocial support group, of which the numbers we have given at different times, but I can still give it, which is 081-160-2144 or 3. So you'll either speak to a psychiatrist, psychologist, all those people that work there. So 
what we request for the community at large is also to bear with mm. us to know that we are really few. Mm. And even in the private, there you make uh, consultations, but overall in Namibia we are saying we are a handful. Mm. We don't reach the number of 10. Yeah. So for a population of 2.4, 5, how many of us per each individual? Psychiatrists. Psychiatrists. Yes. Yes. Less than 10, 10 psychiatrists yeah. in total. Wow. So, wow. mm -hmm. so yes. that means yeah. it's an area with, that we need we to need think to of in. now. Mm. We need to invest now because we'll have sequelae after this mm. and we'll not be able to deal with it. I think another concern, which was also in the previous SARS and MERS, is the mental health care, oh, the, the health care workers, the frontline workers. Their mental health is really um, uh, taking, having great, there's great consequences for having to deal with this um, a patient that's severely ill and you have a limited capacity whether you feel supported by um, your institution um, so so that we also need to not forget our our health workers and then the other thing is the patients already have mental illness so patients with bipolar disorder schizophrenia patients with OCD um, anxiety and depressive disorders are a lot um, higher at risk of having a relapse in their symptoms. They might be scared to go to their clinic and go get their their injection or their medication. Um, or the, the isolation, the quarantine might be even worse mm -hmm. for these patients mm -hmm. who really need the support of the community and the family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a very alienating yeah. mm -hmm. you, you are alienated from your family members, you're alienated mm -hmm. from your friends. Working in the units on a daily basis, you can see how much how much of a toll it has on those patients. They cannot even speak because they, they are on a ventilator, obviously, but some of them are awake and they speak into what we call a CPAP machine, trying to reach out to somebody, trying to get that human touch. So what we want to encourage is we want to reach out to each other, even if it's not physically. Just take a phone and call somebody if you need to. Don't suffer alone. Patients can't even really see the the doctors because everybody's in PPE and, and mm -hmm. masks and so on. There's a very concerning question here stating, I have anxiety and prone to panic attacks. Now the person says they are scared. If they get COVID, they won't cope emotionally. In an instance like that, what would you advise, Dr. Amniela? Okay. In that case, it's a vicious circle. Remember we are saying anxiety symptoms themselves present with fear, isn't it? Mm -hmm. With fear and they're anxious to also go out. You know, they have physical symptoms. Now, this is a person who is well, but worried that they might contract the illness while they don't actually have the illness. So that itself is feeding their anxiety. So it is like Dr. Brewer said, do what you can control, you know? Take control of the situation that you can. Some of the things you won't be able to control. But even the thought process itself, we say when you have a therapist or somebody you can talk to, they teach you how to, to be in control of these thoughts instead of going continuously without having answers. Because you're obviously answering yourself, but you're answering yourself negatively, fear, making yourself fearful. Therefore, your stress level keep going up. Mm -hmm. And therefore, therefore, your symptoms of your anxiety also is going up. But we are saying also most of the people with anxiety are on medication. This is the time that you need to keep your medication. The one concern people are worried about when we give them medication, they say, are you giving me your medication that makes people dependent? Not all the medications make a person dependent or, 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 or addictive. And also, what would you be? Would you want to be on medication and be in control of your situation and be in control of your health? Or would you rather be ha having the anxiety but not being on treatment? Which is also coming back to the system, to the question of your vaccination. If you take your vaccination, you know you will also not be as anxious as you are. And the panic attacks also, they come because you are worried. But if you learn how to control that, that worry, then you are okay, you will be able to have that. Even somebody who doesn't have anxiety, obviously in this unknown, because of the unknown of COVID, that is why they are worried. But w we're saying that we have come a long way from where we were last year and where we are now. Whatever is available, use it. And we are saying also, we advocate for our patients. But another way of also 
looking at how we can um, titrate the information down is look at who does this person look up to or believe in. For example, in the villages, we use the leaders. And then we inform them more about mental health, with the effect of COVID, the effect of vaccine, how to use. And then they titrate it down to the people because somebody will look at this and then listen and then go for that. For, for that. And then we're saying we're also there at all the time. Use those toll-free toll numbers uh, and the numbers we gave you and then, you know, reach out. Is your brain and your body speaks to each other. So mm -hmm. if you are anxious or stressed or depressed, it actually affects your immune system and it makes yeah. you more vulnerable mm -hmm. to infections. So if somebody has anxiety or depression, rather go see a psychologist or GP or psychiatrist because we have very good treatment for anxiety and depression. So that if you do get COVID, you'll, you're probably going to be okay because mm -hmm. you'll have your anxiety at least under control. Dealing with that. Yeah, so I just quickly want to do a quick time check. How much time do we still have? And uh, are there questions that need to be responded to um, from the platforms? About 30 minutes left. Uh, but then again, my suggestion for now would be to skip question seven. That's now what to do when contracting COVID because it was answered yes. during, the, the, during the anxiety. So questions go, go straight to the questions for the ministry and that's now on the question of oxygen i think yesterday and, and i think what we'll also do um, because there's clearly a lot more questions than what we have time mm -hmm. um, when we do convene because we need to let nbc go to the normal scheduling mm -hmm. we will continue to sit here and we'll make sure that we answer the questions i can see all my panelists are looking at me shocked like what <laughs> is this woman talking about <laughs> But, but we'll make sure that the questions that we do have, um, we'll put them into written form and make sure mm. that they are circulated sure. on our social media and platforms. The crew can also stay on just to record so that we can Fantastic. broadcast it during okay. one of our slots, the entire, entire program. Excellent. Thanks, Brad. Okay, so I will also skip some of the questions to the ministry, and that is now the question on hospitals are running out of oxygen patients are left to die and you people are here advocating for people to vaccinate it. Especially at Kadutura Hospital, the situation is saddening. Dr. Elson. I think that, that those are two separate points. So the first point is, the question you need to ask yourself is why have we reached the capacity for oxygen in the state facilities? We know that we have a, an oxygen plant at Ventuk Central Hospital. And we know that the oxygen plant can produce about 600 liters to some degree uh, on an hourly basis. And the COVID ICU in and of itself uses 300 liters of oxygen every hour. That's 50% of the capacity. Two years ago, we did not have a COVID ICU. So just imagine that. So now we still have the cardiac unit, which is also an intensive care unit. Now we also have the main ICU, which is also an intensive care unit. Just imagine for yourself the burden that this disease has put on the state facilities. This is only Ventuk Central Hospital. With regards to Katatura Hospital, we have had respiratory patients in the past, particularly patients who um, suffer from tuberculosis. And of course, the sequelae of, of tuberculosis, Dr. Brevere can speak to that. We have patients who have been oxygen dependent already in the past, and they would require continuous oxygen from the state as, as they are state patients. So speaking to that point, I think when you, when you are saying that the hospital does not have oxygen and they're, making, uh, they're causing the deaths of all of these patients, and then on the other hand, you're saying that you're being coerced or being forced to take the vaccine, I think those two people, uh, it's, it's, it seems to me like it's a duality actually. So what we need to cons consider is, are we going to wait for natural immunity does it mean that we're going to let all of our pregnant mothers die from coronavirus? Does it mean that we're going to let all of our elders die from coronavirus? Or does it mean that we're going to step up, address this problem as a, as a nation and really get ourselves vaccinated? And I think really that is the point of the answer. It's not that we, we were not prepared for this. This is just that it's an unprecedented pandemic that we are currently faced with. And I think the private hospitals themselves also have been overburdened. I, I, I wanted to cut in there and say, I mean, it's, it's not only a, a, a state hospital problem. Oxygen is a worldwide problem. I mean, we, um, no, no government, no 
private healthcare facility can plan and manage a pandemic. It's, we can't have the infrastructure to manage the amount of patients. Um, at the facility where I work, I mean, we, we're going to through 1.2 tons of oxygen a day. I mean, the, the, the companies that have to deliver that oxygen, they don't have the production capacity for that. And the, why do we need it? Because we've suddenly got this massive surge of patients where they require oxygen as a life-saving um, life modality. And what were you using before COVID? Oh, I mean, we, ju just to give you an idea, our, our backup system, we only had five tons of oxygen. So um, we had to double up on that, and even that is 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 struggling. Um, so I mean, we we weren't we're probably at about double capacity at the moment, what we what we use, um, and it, that that's a concern. And I'm sitting there every day having, for instance, there the, the, when the when the pandemic started, we had. Um, we struggled with ventilators. We didn't have enough ventilators, so we bought a few extra ventilators, and then. The South Africans published data on using a device which we call high flow oxygen um, in in helping patients or patients who uh, high flow preventing them from getting to a ventilator basically. But the the difference is a normal ventilator uses between five and ten liters of of oxygen per minute. These high flow ventilators they use sixty liters of oxygen per minute. So it, it, so what's happened now is I can't use those devices because we, we, we can't supply enough oxygen for these devices to, to work, bearing in mind everything else we, we having to um, we're having to manage. And and that puts us really in a in a difficult situation because I have to now decide which patients can I help and which which I can't help. And I'm sitting there every day and thinking what on earth can we do to get out of this system? And every time I get back to the same answer, we have to vaccinate. Mm -hmm. We have to try and prevent this struggle that the hospitals are going through because the hospital system will never be able to cope, no matter if it's private, no matter if it's public, no matter if it's first world, if it's developing world. The, the reality is healthcare cannot protect against a pandemic. It's, mm -hmm. it's just not possible. Yeah, and I think if you take the vaccine out of this equation, you find yourself hitting against a brick wall. There's no way around it. I think it's really something that the nation needs really to take up very strongly. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Ellerton, I don't know if it's, it was you on television, but there was a state doctor who looked like you, who, who made a point that I didn't forget, where he said, hospitals are not the front line. Mm -hmm. We want to keep you out of the hospitals because we can't cope and we'll never cope. We can get more oxygen, but we don't have enough healthcare workers. We don't, so, and I found that quite a compelling um, point. I'd just like to, to, to sketch the scenario for you a little bit. In, for example, in Katatura Hospital, we have had to transform four wards separately. Yeah. Apart from the respiratory unit that we've, we've used as a sort of a sounding board to try and absorb some of these patients, we've had to open up four separate wards just for COVID um, in Katatura Hospital. That is outside of what we've had to do for, for Bantuk Central Hospital. Mm -hmm. That is outside of the military hospital, which is basically a tent which we've had to mobilize. And now you can imagine all of those medical officers that have had to have been mobilized. All of our specialist physicians are stretched to their capacity. I think everybody is spread thinly over. It really is, it's not as if nothing is being done. On a daily basis, you find yourself on the verge of tears when you have to decide between somebody who's, for example, 34 years old or somebody who's 55 years old, but they're both productive members of society. So really we are very, very, short-staffed and very very we are pushing ourselves so I want uh, also everybody to know that we really are not just standing behind being lackadaisical efforts are being made actually on a minute-to-minute -minute basis if you think about it to comment on that uh, I think we need to applaud the ministry and the private private ho hospitals um, it's not only also just the, the Katutura and the cent the central itself the military that we we, we, we have opened but it's also now a requirement like even for us at mental health mm -hmm. there is provision that we need to make every day you see to say okay which of the words can we mm -hmm. transform mm -hmm. 
to accommodate our patients who are COVID positive because within them having a mental illness, they also have COVID. Mm. So obviously people are like, now where do you accommodate this person? Yes, it's our own, own, own owners to at least treat them. But then some on the other hand, then we need also need to look at and say, these people are just human like every other person. Mm. And therefore COVID does not discriminate to say you are mental, you have a mental problem or something. Mm -hmm. But also out there, honestly, we need to honor really the healthcare workers. They are so way overstressed. Mm -hmm. Even the nurses are working more than 12 hour shift. Mm -hmm. But mentally wise, we are saying this is also not healthy mm -hmm. for our people because we are now exposing them to develop mental health problems. And it is not uncommon for us to see our own health workers being on antidepressants, anti-anxieties, and, and, and psycho psychotic um, medications, antipsychotic medication. We are saying that we have to work together to support them, mm -hmm. even support the people who have the illness itself. It's for them to wave through that. You know, it is very bad when you are sick, when you have the COVID and you don't have a support. Mm -hmm. But also remember the front front workers, mm -hmm. you know, really they don't have a system where they are supporting themselves. Mm -hmm. So often with if you have 50 or 60 or 100 COVID patients that you're treating, there are 50 or 60 or 100 patients, family members, mm -hmm. worried, phoning, texting, mm -hmm. getting angry because the doctor's not getting back to you in time. So I, I don't think the public also realizes that these doctors get, you know, phoned 100 times a day. Mm -hmm. In the middle of the night, mm -hmm. every half an hour, every night, and then you go and do your work. So. Um, and that's why we really are encouraging people, please do what you can do, and that is vac vaccinate, social distance, wear masks. Dr. Ellison, have you been faced with angry abuse of family <laughs> members and Dr. Brevet, you? So I'm currently rotating in the COVID ICU, and I can tell you that, y yes, family members want, they physically want to come to you, <laughs> and in as much as that is impossible, and sometimes they are frustrated with the, the, the little bit of information that you give them. We have to limit what we say to them mm -hmm. because we don't want to be too harsh with our, with, our, with our relatives. But also we don't have enough time because the more time we spend talking to relatives, the less time we have available in the unit to be able to treat our patients. And I have to tell you that they are critical patients. They really literally need to be seen moment to moment, mm -hmm. minute to minute, hour to hour. So the more time we spend trying to console our relatives, the less time we have. Mm -hmm. So I think people need to be reassured that yes, we are pushing ourselves beyond our capacity and we, would, we understand where you are. We understand that you are frustrated and really we want to relieve the frustration that you have. But in, in the capacity that we are human as well and that we only have certain amount, a certain amount of time available to us, I think we need to understand that our first priority and our first concern is to our patient. I agree with that. I think um, I try and understand that that families are sitting with with also with anxiety mm -hmm. and also struggles. And I, w I always explain it like this: before the pandemic, if I had an ICU patient, and um, the the family were able to see the patient, they will they'll go through the process of realizing this patient is either deteriorating or improving, but they will be able to see this. And with 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 COVID. I think myself and the the healthcare workers, nursing, they are the only link that this the family has to their to the their loved one, which which puts a lot of extra stress on us. I, I I had this discussion yesterday. I mean, there was a time in this week where I had 55 COVID patients, where I was looking after them. I told them if I spent two minutes with every single family, I'll spend pretty much two hours just discussing with the families. I'd I I don't have that 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 time available but in a way one wants to as a healthcare provider also mm. ca care for the, for the families and let them see the process that their loved one is is going through so it's a it's a very difficult place to be in i think um because you don't want to to alienate the families you want to involve them but it is unfortunately the the human resources is is taking strain with that mm -hmm. uh, madam first lady you have eight minutes to continue the discussion and then wrap up. Okay. So, so we've got, um, we'll continue the discussion when we're not live on NBC anymore and we'll make sure that that, um, 
is provided uh, uh, to NBC and on our social media platforms. But there are a few things that I really do want to emphasize and also want to give the panelists just a moment to say what is very important to them, um, and especially on the issue of vaccines. And, and I think I am somebody who is self-reflective. And if I look at my own experience of waiting based on somebody else's health assessment before I get vaccinated and waiting for what I regarded as an ideal vaccine, I certainly put myself at a higher risk of everything I feared. All of my fears around vaccine, COVID's reality was that it was much higher risk than all of those fears. So this thing of waiting for a perfect vaccine when you don't have any medical reason to do so is waiting for perfect when good enough is available. And I'm going to rectify that what I regard to be a mistake by having a vaccine by what is available. Those with specialized conditions and who need to consult with their medical practitioners should and can do that. But I certainly don't have any condition that prevents me from getting a vaccine now. And I'd really like to start with you, um, Dr. Bouvier. So what I will vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. But I also want to ask people, everybody's struggling in a different way. Be kind, be supportive. If you know if somebody is really um, in need of help, reach out, go drop off food, help with the children who's sitting at home unsupervised. Let's, as a community, pull together and, and get through this. Because I know we can. We just need to, to take the steps and, and move forward. OK. Um, I will advocate for mental health uh, because I'm saying that there's no health without mental health. So importantly, you need to take care of yourself. Be aware of what you are feeling, why you are feeling what you are feeling, label your emotions, and be in control of your behavior. We are saying that behavior is something that we need to learn and be, take cognizance of that and force it to somebody who is visiting you. Limit unnecessary visitations. We are so modern as we have rituals. Do that. Check up on each other on WhatsApp. But look out for those who already had mental illness because this can go both ways. COVID itself can cause a mental illness. Mental illness can cause you to have uh, a, a, a low immune system. Therefore, you will acquire COVID compared to other people. Vaccination. No, take note of who is um, circulating the information. A very important thing we did not mention is personalities. You know, personalities is very important because somebody who is having a personality that is difficult to accept other people's position and, and, and uh, respect their distance will not adhere to the rules. Also, a person who is developing psychotic symptoms some of them believe that somebody else is spying on them and therefore they can believe in Illuminati and those things. So be very careful that, that we need to also look and take care of this person. Make sure they go to mental health and make use of your mental, mental health workers Excellent. and behavioral science, Excellent. please. And I think that's <laughs> the most important point, uh, health care workers. Uh, Dr. Bouvet? Yeah, I, th I think the main message is as a country, we need to really pull together um, and and um, try and manage this this pandemic that we're sitting with. And we we've got the tools available. Um, we need the the motivation and the the public support in that. I mean, we need to get our our vaccine rollout going stronger, so that we can get to herd immunity. Herd immunity through infections. We're seeing a small glimpse of that now with our hospitals full, people dying. We, we can't, as an as a healthcare provider, I can't see that that being the answer to this. I mean, we, 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 we're not going to get there without severely traumatizing our nation. So I think we have to look at the evidence. We have to look at the empiric, properly done evidence that's available to us and, and use that to make decisions to get ourselves vaccinated. So my message would be, um, I want us to l limit community spread. And by limiting community spread, that means that we have to actually adhere to the social distancing. We have to adhere to wearing our masks. And most importantly, have concern for your fellow human being. Because if we do not have concern for our fellow human being, it was definitely going to turn 
into a humanitarian crisis if it's not already at that level. Because what we have to deal with is we have to deal with losing mothers and we have to deal with losing fathers. So even if you think that you can overcome this virus, consider that and get yourself vaccinated and self-isolate. And I'd like to wrap up with uh, something that uh, Dr. Hamniela, Dr. Ellison, doc both Dr. Brevers have said and which, what is the essence of this campaign. Love protects. That's also the principle that underpins the Bible. The Bible is about love, about looking after your neighbor, about loving your neighbor as much as you love yourself. And vaccines are about love because vaccines save lives and lives that we love, and that includes all members of this country, all citizens. It's about love, that we want to get the vaccination right, to get the right information out, so we're not irritated by anybody's question. There is no stupid question. We must ask these questions. We must answer them. And we must remember vaccines do save lives. Love protects. These scientists are all God's children. They're all living within their purpose, using their God-given gifts to make sure they save your life and the life of your loved ones. So thank you. Love protects. Why are you smiling?